Right, this final short video is just to show a few applications of Taylor series. They are very useful um, in physics and you'll see them many times in your classes. So one of the ways they're useful is if you've got an equation, some physical equation, which is very complicated, but you know that you're only interested in this equation around a particular point. For example, you might only be interested in the case of low temperature or around a particular position in space then you can use Taylor series around that point to simplify the equation. Okay. Now, an example which comes up a lot, and I think it's very good for you to learn, is what happens if x is small in these Taylor series. Okay. So, this really is very easy. If you've got the basic Taylor series here, if x is small enough, you can just cut off the Taylor series after the first term. So, for example, you get that, that, okay, okay or even that. Um, well, okay, that should be consistent at least. Let's just go to x, okay. So that's that, 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 and this. So in other words, if you're expanding around x close to zero in these series, as you often are, then you find e to the x is approximately 1 plus x, cos of x is approximately 1, the next term here is minus x squared over 2, sine x is approximately equal to x, log of 1 plus x is approximately equal to x, and 1 plus x to the p is approximately equal to 1 plus px. Okay, And these formulas are all very useful, so again, a good idea to remember these. And a particular example of this last one is when p equals minus 1. You get that 1 over 1 plus x is approximately 1 minus x. So this one is, I think, the thing that's used most often, this expansion, this approximation. Okay, But you do see examples of these quite frequently in physics. Okay. So I want to give you a second example which is a bit more physical and this is an example you will almost certainly see in mechanics class this is a swinging pendulum so you suppose that you've got a pendulum that means a rope of length L you've got some mass on the end mass M let's say okay and the pendulum is swinging right so it goes backwards and forth backwards and forth if we say that the angle here is theta then the forces on the pendulum, the forces on the mass, we ignore the weight of the string, it's got a force going down here, mg due to gravity. It's got the tension going up here, which you can call T. So you can work out that the net force along this direction, if we call this direction here the x direction, right? so this is x equals 0 plus x minus x, then you can see that the force going along this direction is just the component of mg in this direction. Okay, so if I draw it here, okay, this angle here is theta, so therefore the component of force along this direction, this angle is theta, is going to be mg sine theta. Okay. So the component of force accelerating the mass along this line here is mg sine theta. So the equation of motion of the swinging pendulum is force equals mass times acceleration, right? So the force is mg sine theta, and this is equal to mass times acceleration, so that's m times d2x by dt squared. And I can use the fact that here, if this angle is theta and this length is L, then x is just equal to L times theta, as long as theta is measured in radians. Right, that's true. So therefore, I can substitute x equals L theta here, and I get ML d2 theta by dt squared. In other words, d2 theta by dt squared is equal to Okay, 
It's not quite correct because there's a minus sign, right? Here, x is negative, but the force is pointing in the positive x direction. So that means this force should have a minus sign there. Okay. So now you get minus g over l times sine of theta. Okay. That's correct. So this is the equation of motion for this swinging pendulum. Unfortunately, you can't solve this equation exactly. Oh, well, you kind of can. Okay. This equation is not straightforward to solve exactly. However, oh yeah, wait, okay, sorry. However, you can solve it provided that the swinging of the pendulum is very small. So if we assume that theta is small, theta is much, much less than 1, then sine of theta is going to be approximately equal to theta, okay? In which case you get d2 theta by dt squared is minus g over L times theta. And this one you can solve, this is simply the harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion. Harmonic oscillation. The simple harmonic oscillator equation, I'll call it like that. Okay. Which, if you take an introductory mechanics class, you will definitely solve this equation. Okay. So the equation, exact equation for the swinging pendulum is difficult. That's this one, difficult to solve. But if you know that the pendulum is only swinging gently, so the angle here is small, then you can use a Taylor series. So I'm using this approximation, right? Sine x is approximately x. So sine theta is approximately theta. So with this approximation, you get an equation which you can solve, which is the simple harmonic oscillator. OK, so that's an example of the use in physics. OK, a final example, which again is sometimes useful, is for calculating limits. OK, and there's one question on the practice sheet uh, about this. So find, here's an example of a question you might be asked. Let's suppose I ask you to find the limit as x goes to 0 of x minus sine x divided by x to the power n, where n is some integer, let's say. Okay. So this is not easy to give an answer to, because as x goes to 0, if n is positive, then this will go to 0. And also, because sine x is approximately equal to x, the top also goes to 0. So as x goes to 0, you get 0 divided by 0, and you know that doesn't make sense. But you can work out what the answer is by approximate, sorry, by expanding these as Taylor series. So here I need the Taylor series of sine is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial and so on. Okay, so you see that the x's cancel here. So the first term is x cubed over 3 factorial minus x to the 5 over 5 factorial plus dot dot dot. So this limit should still be there. divided by x to the power n. So now I can divide each term by x to the power n. So this is limit x goes to 0 of x to the 3 minus n over 3 factorial minus x to the 5 minus n over 5 factorial and so on. So what's this equal to? I'm afraid I'm going to have to write a little bit more. There are three different cases. So the most interesting case, perhaps, is if n equals 3. If n equals 3, then all of these higher terms, this is like x squared, the next one will be like x to the 4, these all go to 0 as x goes to 0. So you can ignore all the higher terms. And the only one that matters is this one. So if n equals 3, I just get 1 divided by 3 factorial, so I get 1 over 6 if n equals 3. Okay. Now if n is less than 3, 
so I get something positive here, then this also goes to zero, and all of these terms go to zero. So I get zero if n is less than three. Now, if n is greater than three, then this is like x to the minus one, x to the minus two, and so on. This will diverge. In other words, it will go to plus and minus infinity. So it diverges if n is greater than 3. Okay. So therefore the limit of this function as x goes to 0 depends upon the value of n. If n is 3 is equal to a sixth. If n is less than 3 it's equal to 0. And if n is greater than 3 it diverges. So it goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay. And the way we work this out is by expanding sine x as a Taylor series and taking the, the first term that does not cancel. Okay, so one of the questions on the practice sheet this week is like this too. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say in this video, just a few examples of how Taylor series are used in physics um, and how they are used to calculate limits.